welcome to this direct dialogue with Ms. Carrie Lam, the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Ed Region. This webinar is organized by the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices in Brussels and Berlin and co-organized by the Association of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Belgium and Hong Kong Society, the Hellenic Federation of Enterprises, Italy, Hong Kong Association, and Netherlands, Hong Kong Business Association. We also have 18 supporting organizations from 15 European countries for today's direct dialogue and a very large number of uh, registrations. So it's good to see all this interest in this dialogue. Welcome from me in particular. I'm the moderator for today's event, Fabian Zulik. I'm the chief executive and chief economist of the European Policy Center which is a Brussels-based independent think tank. Apart from Ms. Carrie Lam, uh, we also have three principal officials of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government. And these are Edward Yao, the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, uh, Wong Kam Singh, the Secretary for the Environment, and Christopher Yu, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury. We're also glad to have the representatives from the five co-organizers today, Volker Dreyer, the chief executive of foreign trade and member of the executive board of the Association of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Alexander de Beer, chairman of the Belgium Hong Kong Society, George Chirogianis, the deputy director general of the Hellenic Federation of Enterprises, Ricardo Fuocci, president of the Italy Hong Kong Association, and Hans Pulis, chairman of the Netherlands Hong Kong Business Association. They will all have a chance to ask a question later, but there will also be a chance for you to ask questions in the chat. We will try to get to all those questions, but given the large number of participants, also be aware that we cannot address all of the questions which will be raised. Um, thank you all for being here and being part of this important dialogue. COVID-19 has had many negative effects, but it has the positive effect of encouraging us to bring people together in this online format. It's good to have these discussions in the current environment where global cooperation and exchange has become even more important than previously, but also, of course, more challenged. We have some big common global challenges which need to be addressed. And I think to address those, a dialogue is always important and is always a step forward to get to a solution. At the same time, we also need to address the concerns and challenges openly, including the particular situation in Hong Kong, which has been very present in the news and the public debate in the EU. So I'm very much looking forward to this open discussion. We will start with the intervention by Mrs. Carrie Lam. Thank you very much uh, for being available for this dialogue, and we're looking forward to your reflections. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sulik, for being the moderator of this uh, very uh, important event. I've been looking forward to a direct dialogue with our stakeholders and members of the business chambers in uh, con on continental Europe. Let me first thank, um, of course, uh, my two offices in Brussels and Berlin, and also the five chambers co-organizing this event and the many supporting organizations uh, that you have mentioned. Um, during my tenure as a chief executive of Hong Kong SAR in the past three and a half years, I've been to uh, Europe uh, several times, uh, particularly to Belgium and France, and in the course of attending the World Economic Forum at Davos. I've been I've been three time uh, attendant at the Davos World Economic Forum. So um, I might have met some of um, the chamber members uh, in person. Now, as time is uh, very limited, I will keep my introduction uh, very short and uh, look forward to interacting and answering any questions. Uh, 2020 is a very challenging year for all of us, and as we Move into 2021, I suppose whether it is in uh, Europe or in Hong Kong, the key priority is vaccine. Everybody is now uh, chasing and looking forward to vaccination so that um, we can resume business and life could go back to normal. Uh, I would like to start by saying or expecting what would happen after a very effective vaccination program when business goes back to normal and people are looking for opportunities throughout the world. And that is where I think Hong Kong will stand out because of Hong Kong's strengths. By the way, uh, at present, based on our latest uh, survey by Invest Hong Kong, we 
do have 9,000 overseas and mainland companies. And uh, without counting UK companies, we have 1,600 coming from members of the European Union. So there is already a very strong presence of uh, EU companies in Hong Kong. But after what I have briefed, I'm going to um, uh, share with you. I hope we are seeing more. Uh, I just cover five uh, factors that I hope you will take into account when you start to think about business recovery or business expansion. One is Hong Kong's very unique positioning, whether geographically or constitutionally. Geographically, Hong Kong has always been the gateway to the mainland of China, and we are also a city of connectivity. So we connect mainland enterprises to the rest of the world, and we help overseas companies to access the mainland market. Uh, this will become more and more important as we are seeing a large number of mainland enterprises represented or headquartered in Hong Kong. And our aviation and shipping um, hub status will continue to be strengthened. Right now, we are building a third runway and also uh, expanding the aviation network. Constitutionally, the advantages of Hong Kong, of course, lie in one country, two systems. We preserve after 24 years as a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. We preserve the uh, way of life, the capitalist system, the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, uh, no capital controls and free convertible currency and um, a low and simple tax system. What's more, uh, more recently, uh, towards the latter part of last year, I'm sure some of you have heard about this new economic model in the mainland of China, the dual circulation economic strategy. And this is right now the buzzword in uh, the mainland economy. And Hong Kong plays an um, important role in the two strong components in this dual circulation economic strategy. The internal circulation means uh, more emphasis on the domestic economy, uh, spurred by uh, increasing consumption of the 1.4 billion people in this mainland market. So Hong Kong will play a role in terms of our goods and services. As far as the second component, which is the external circulation, that is linking the mainland economy to the rest of the world. I've just mentioned about Hong Kong's uh, connectivity. And of course, some of you who have been in Hong Kong will realize that in the last 17 years, Hong Kong has benefited from what we call SIPA, Closed Economic Partnership Arrangement, which is a form of FTA between Hong Kong and mainland China that provides preferential access, including um, zero duty access of goods made in Hong Kong. And the beautiful thing of this thing is um, SIPA is nationality neutral. So EU companies based in Hong Kong will enjoy exactly the same benefits as local companies. This is point number one, the unique position in Hong Kong. Point number two is growth. Business are looking for growth and I. I don't think there is any dispute about growth being in this part of the world, that is Asia, particularly in the mainland of China. In fact, in 2020, uh, China is the only major economy that has still recorded a positive growth of over 2%, and for this year, it will be 8% growth. Um, of course, uh, Hong Kong has gone through a difficult period with a minus 6.1% uh, contraction, but we are also looking forward to positive growth uh, this year, and uh, especially we benefit from the growth in the mainland China as can be seen from the recovery of our export and import in the latter half of last year already. So the post-COVID-19 uh, situation, I'm sure Asia would stand out significantly. The third uh, factor which a business may wish to take into account is uh, this year will be the first year of the 14th five-year plan of the People's Republic of China. And for a third time, Hong Kong will feature um, separately, well, or prominently as what we call a Hong Kong chapter in the 14 five year plan. And particularly in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, there will be a strategy to relate the Greater Bay Area development to the 14 five year plan. So um, for EU companies, we can now look forward to a regional economy where this booming with a population of 72 million, and you remember I mentioned about consumption domestically. So the 72 million people in the Greater Bay Area will be our consumers. Uh, already it is now a 1.7 trillion US dollar economy, which is uh, comparable to Italy and bigger than Australia. 
And the per capita is already 23,000 US dollars, perhaps the highest in the mainland of China, and set to grow because of the affluence and the development. The fourth factor is um, China is now looking for not just quantitative growth, but quality growth so, and sustainable growth. Uh, recently, in the United Nations uh, speech, uh, President Xi Jinping has pledged that um, China uh, will aim to achieve carbon neutrality uh, by 2060, after having reached the peak in carbon emission in 2030. Subsequently, uh, I have also announced on behalf of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region that we are aiming at carbon neutrality by 2050, because we have already peaked in our carbon emission about six years ago. So in this year, 2021, um, sitting uh, next to me, uh, the Secretary of Environment will announce a popularization plan for electric vehicles, uh, ultimately, hopefully, to phase out the diesel and petrol vehicles, and also a blueprint on waste management. So all these will require a lot of technology and business experience. I may as well just um, help to promote some European companies <laughs> at this juncture, because at the moment, almost all our waste uh, facilities, uh, state-of-the-art waste facilities, uh, are from Europe. Our sludge treatment plant, what we call the TPAC, is French technology, Veolia. Our electrical waste recycling plant, what we call the WePAC, is German technology, Elba. And uh, our food waste, the first plant, OPAC, and the second plant, uh, second OPAC, organic waste, I think they are either UK or Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And then the most exciting is this huge IWMF, the Integrated Waste Management Facility, is Belgium, is Capo Sigas. So you can imagine we have to rely on new people to uh, bring us the um, state-of-the-art European technology uh, to deal with climate change, uh, waste management, and so on. So finally, this brings me to the point of finance. Uh, Hong Kong is an international financial center accounting for over 20% of our GDP is booming. Uh, 2020, we were the world's number two in terms of funds raised through IPO. And uh, we have just um, broken the record in terms of daily turnover in our stock market, particularly with the connectivity with Shenzhen and uh, Shanghai stock market. So we're going for green finance. Uh, so that uh, our financial services will also contribute to this climate change uh, uh, agenda. Last week, my government announced that we will issue uh, 2.5 billion US dollars green bonds. And uh, we are encouraging and promoting mainland companies, particularly those in Shenzhen, to also um, um, uh, issue green bonds in Hong Kong. So financial services will remain as strong as ever. In fact, despite the last 18 months of social unrest and uh, worries and uh, COVID-19, our um, financial services have proven to be very strong, very robust, very resilient, as I mentioned, uh, doing very good business. So we love to share all this with our EU companies. I'll stop here and uh, look forward to answering uh, questions or receiving any feedback. My three colleagues will help me to address questions in their respective uh, portfolio, ranging from commerce, economic development, to financial, to the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Executive, um, for that overview and uh, these uh, reasons um, for uh, the um, continued engagement with uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we'll start now with uh, questions by myself and uh, the co-organizers uh, before we um, look at the questions from the audience. Um, I'll start with my own question, um, which has to do with the overall environment. Um, currently, economic cooperation between the EU and China is controversial in Europe. Um, the members of the European Parliament have criticized the recent decision to reach a political con conclusion of the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Um, and they have particularly admonished serious and ongoing human rights violations and particular concerns with regard to Hong Kong and the changes to the security law, which for many have put the solidity of the legal framework um, for Hong Kong in question. 
do these political controversies not inevitably hinder the development of the economic and commercial relationship between the EU and Hong Kong? Well, um, I have to um, I have to admit that um, some of the things that uh, you have mentioned, Mr. Zulik, uh, particularly about the enactment of the national security law and the arrest of um, some suspects who have um, committed offenses under the national security law and the public order events, have raised um, some concerns in the Western world, uh, whether it's in the United States, uh, UK, or, or Europe. But I would just have to make this uh, very clear. Uh, when one talk about bilateral international relations, um, the fundamental principle is mutual respect and non-intervention. So uh, I hope that um, another country will not um, intervene into the internal uh, affairs of the other country. Uh, so enacting a piece of national security law to safeguard national security is clearly a national matter for, uh, for any country. So um, our country, the Central People's Government uh, was doing this particular act. So this is point number one. So uh, it will not, it should not affect the EU China or EU Hong Kong relationship if there is that mutual respect and recognition of how to handle international relations. Similarly for human rights, I remember when President Xi spoke at the EU occasion some time ago, he, he, he openly said that um, there is no one size fits all when it comes to human rights. Uh, human rights could never be the best. It could be, it could be made better. So every jurisdiction has to respect another jurisdiction in terms of how they handle this uh, rights and freedoms um, matter. As far as Hong Kong is concerned, we are very fortunate because our rights and freedoms are protected and enshrined in a constitution called the Basic Law of the Hong Kong SAR of the People's Republic of China. So uh, as long as we uh, respect that, uh, we understand uh, how we should deal with that sort of relationship. I don't see why um, the mutual beneficial uh, trade and investment, as well as joint efforts to tackle climate change matters should be affected by those incidents. And finally, I just want to make uh, one more comment is uh, the comment made by the WHO Director General recently. Let's go for depoliticization. Don't try to politicize everything, whether it's vaccine or, or, or virus and so on. Let's deal with the, with the issue. Uh, we are very um, uh, positive about bilateral relationship between Hong Kong and EU. Uh, we are very keen to attract more e European technology and investment to Hong Kong. We stand ready to become the uh, gateway and the, um, the base for EU companies to access the mainland market. And I hope that this will be taken into full account by our European partners. Dear Mrs. Lam, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your time with us today. As uh, DIHK, the Association of German Chambers of Commerce, we very much value the opportunity to co-host this exchange. As DIHK, we uh, are coordinating a network of worldwide 142 locations in more than 90 countries uh, in the world. And it is not exaggerated to say that Hong Kong is uh, one or even uh, the most uh, favorite uh, uh, location we do have. We are very, very well aware uh, that uh, Hong Kong is an important location for, for German companies. Uh, in, in, in the region, but uh, in entire Asia, I do want to say. Uh, we are regularly sur surveying uh, our member companies in our World Business Outlook survey among uh, our worldwide more than 50,000 uh, member companies. Our companies uh, in Hong Kong uh, told us about their expectations in fall 2020 expectations for the year, for the, the current year, the year 2021, 20, uh, uh, that the majority, more than 60% stated that uh, they hope for the same or better this year from their business uh, perspectives. But uh, a striking 38% said that they expect uh, worse. Uh, and the same ratio of responding companies said that they would lower their investments in Hong Kong with an additional 20% indicating no investments 
at all. This goes hand in hand uh, with plannings uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, the employment. So uh, the majority of the survey companies are in the service sector. And the main reason, of course, is the pandemic for this bit gloomy outlook, I would suggest. So, uh, but Hong Kong is doing an admirable job to manage uh, the pandemic and the situation. But however, second most important reason, the business obstacles uh, our uh, companies uh, uh, gave us was the economic policy framework. So my question to you is what do you make of this and what measures can you envisage to in assure these companies of the security and stability to which they are accustomed. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Volker, for sharing with us uh, the survey results. Uh, let me also uh, reciprocate by saying that uh, we attach a lot of importance to our international business chambers. We have um, a high-level meeting within um, a high-level committee within the government called the IBC, the International Business uh, Committee. And the German Chamber, of course, this has been well represented for several decades. And we, um, we seriously uh, took into account uh, feedback given to us. Can I just send, spend one minute to give you an example? For a couple of years, uh, the German uh, automobile industry has been complaining about our restrictive practices, which make it difficult for us to import uh, light buses from Germany because of the length uh, laid down in the legislation and the requirement for emergency exits. Uh, and um, uh, I have asked my colleague who is not here, the Secretary for Transport and Housing to change uh, the legislation in order to accommodate. So the length issue has been addressed. We will shortly address that uh, exit door issue so that German brand uh, light buses could start to come to Hong Kong. So that is a piece of uh, reassuring news that how we try to make Hong Kong as a more business friendly environment accommodating uh, new technology and uh, different business needs. Now, your last comment is how I could assure the, the business community of safety and security. Hong Kong has always been one of the safest uh, cities in the world. In terms of crime rate, uh, that is a uh, number of crimes per 100,000 popula 100, population, we are I think one fifth of Paris, <laughs> which is uh, only 800 uh, crimes per 100,000 people. Uh, yes, uh, in the latter half of 2019, um, there were social unrest and violence on the streets, which have got people uh, worried about the safety and security. But since uh, June last year, after the enactment of the national security law, all those street violence have more or less disappeared. And Hong Kong is now back to as safe and as secure as, her, as she used to be. So if your safety and security refers to law and order, that is very well assured uh, by the national security legislation, by our police force, and all the other things that have made Hong Kong safe uh, previously. If you refer to the rights and um, freedoms, um, freedoms of speech, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Uh, as I mentioned, those rights and freedoms are enshrined uh, under the basic law. And even in the national security law, there is a very explicit provision, uh, Article 4, which is specifies that while we uphold national security, at the same time, we should uphold rights and freedoms, uh, not only in our local legislation, but also uh, those applicate those provisions in the international covenants like the ICCPR that apply to Hong Kong. So um, whether it is on the law and order aspect, on the rights and freedoms aspects, I can assure you that um, Hong Kong is now safe and secure. So we welcome more businesses uh, to come to Hong Kong and to uh, work with us. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for uh, Secretary Edward Yao. Um, concerning the Hong Kong uh, unique selling proposal. What is the, the unique selling proposal in the context of the Greater Bay Area? And how will Hong Kong remain relevant in the coming years among this group of very competitive cities? I think two, two flow. One is um, uh, historically and also present day. In fact, Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area are very much an integral part 
uh, of the most sort of vibrant, robust, uh, promising economies. Because together, we already established quite a lot of uh, sort of business. Uh, transaction, but of course, under the un one country two system, there's still boundary. There's still different system operating, including currency, economic structure. So the the uh, biggest advantage open to us is to make this already uh, sort of integrated uh, economy. Uh, crime on the new height, where we can in fact help the region to become the most competitive open and international uh, economy, not just for Hong Kong or mainland, but also to the wider world. And I think you, have, you must have heard about the, uh, as the chief executive mentioned, I think the 70 million people, and in fact, the very strong uh, economy is already there. But a lot of people would, might not have uh, thought about that. Um, that, in fact, is the wealthiest sort of region within the nation and also um, uh, in mainland China. Actually, they call for a lot of upgrading, for instance, in terms of building the Greater Bay Area into the greenest and most sustainable economy within mainland China. And a lot of uh, expectation also on uh, having professional services serving this sort of a very vibrant and diverse economy. So actually, it calls for uh, sort of uh, uh, a lot of talent and also services from the wider world, where Hong Kong would be naturally the gateway into it. And also, I, I believe uh, a lot of international businesses would look for certainty and also uh, more open market assets, uh, which could be guaranteed uh, in some sort of um, arrangement. And I think the chief executive mentioned that the, the CIPA, the Closer Economic Partnership Arrangement, is a form of FTA, free trade agreement, which is being kept updated almost on an annual basis uh, to facilitate even greater access. And now, and also in building up the Greater Bay Area, we are also having a direct access and participation with the central government in a form of a high level uh, steering committee chaired by uh, Vice Premier Han Zheng and with the chief executive sitting uh, within the same sort of boardroom, so to speak, in mapping out the future. And I, I'm typically Hong Kong is doing this uh, not just for our own businessmen, but also for all the sort of international uh, company present in Hong Kong. I think that's in fact uh, the reason why a lot of uh, companies are interested in GBA in the Greater Bay Area, uh, using Hong Kong as a gateway. If I may just um, uh, supplement uh, what Edward has said, because I, I I'm deeply involved in mm. the Greater Bay Area development. Um, Alexander mentioned about the selling points. Um, I, I can think of uh, these selling points. Actually, I rehearsed some of these selling points in a uh, speech earlier this week when people asked me about Hong Kong and Shenzhen, because you mentioned about the more competitive cities in, uh, in our neighborhood, then Shenzhen <laughs> stands out as the most competitive uh, city. Now, there are several aspects uh, which um, Hong Kong is still very much um, look, for, look to by the mainland cities. And I have first-hand experience working with the Guangdong governor and the mayors and the party secretaries of all these uh, nine GBA mainland cities. One is financial services. Uh, if you talk about Shanghai, then okay, there's a bit more competition, but in the greater Bay Area, nobody will dispute that Hong Kong is the international financial center. And that's why they all need to come to Hong Kong to raise funds and to do this and that. In fact, a couple of hours ago, uh, we have just signed an MOU with the People's Bank of with the People's Bank PBOC, as well as the regulatory bodies on what we call the GBA Private Wealth Connect. In other words, uh, people in the mainland cities of the GBA could um, use Hong Kong's to manage their private wealth. Uh, you remember I mentioned about this region uh, will have more growing affluence in time to come. So one is financial services. The other is in technology. Um, yes, um, Shenzhen is very advanced in its uh, new economy, technology economies. But in this region, the best basic research universities are in Hong Kong. Again, if you look at Beijing, yes, Beijing has Tsinghua, Beijing has Beida. But if you look at the southern part of the peoples of China, the best universities are in Hong Kong. Five of our universities are within the top 100 and they are very good in basic research. And that's why uh, right now, we five of our universities each have their campus 
their new campus in the Greater Bay Area mainland city. Well, the Hong Kong University of Science Technology is going to open a brand new campus in Guangzhou. The uh, Polytechnic University is at advanced stage of discussing a new campus in a city called Foshan and so on and so on. So again, this is our selling point. Similarly, in terms of attracting overseas talents, uh, researchers, professors, we are superior to mainland cities. That's, that's not my conclusion. That's conclusion of my uh, mainland uh, uh, colleagues because of our more westernized uh, way of living, our more open uh, environment and so on. And that's why uh, two months ago, I announced that we would launch a scheme called a Global STEM Professorship uh, Scheme that we will recruit from all over the world, including, of course, from some uh, uh, wonderful e, uh, Europe, uh, European universities, 100 professors to Hong Kong. Uh, but these professors will also work in Shenzhen. Uh, when they have commercialization, they want to translate their research into products and services. So that's point number two. Point number three is uh, the Greater Bay Area needs modern, flexible, and professional services, whether it's in legal, arbitration, consultancy, uh, financial, and patent protection, and so on. And again, this is where Hong Kong string lies. Fourth is, uh, this is a growing market that needs quality goods and quality services. So our medical services, of course, partner with uh, overseas uh, companies could go into the Greater Bay Area mainland cities to provide quality goods and quality services. Apart from universities, of course, because of a language issue, UK is, uh, more advan is more advantaged. There are at least a couple of UK private boarding schools that are now setting up in the Greater Bay Area mainland city because the parents also want to give a diversified education to the kids as they become more resourceful. So there is a market for quality um, uh, education as well. Uh, finally, it's of course in uh, sustainable development. Um, if they want to really um, uh, work with the outside world, then Hong Kong will also be the, um, the platform uh, for them, uh, particularly because under one country, two systems. Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy in conducting our external affairs. Guangdong doesn't have, Shenzhen doesn't have. We have a good network of ETOs all over the world that they don't have. So uh, whenever we go out, for example, when we go to Paris, when we went to Paris in 2016 for the GBA uh, promotion uh, tour and seminars, all the activities were organized by Hong Kong. They were only participating. The same happened in 2019 when we went to Tokyo because we have a Tokyo office. Mm -hmm. So this is our selling point to the Greater Bay Area. And we'll, we love to work with um, our overseas partners to make those selling points even more attractive. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure to support this event and actively take part in this discussion. Thank you all for your, your insight. Let me switch focus to trade and uh, bilateral relations for a while. As you know, Greece stands at the trade crossroad between Asia and Europe. The port of Piraeus, operated by Costco, currently is the largest container uh, port in Southern Europe. And also the Greek maritime sector dominates global trade a global sea trade for uh, decades. Having trade in mind, how can we improve synergies between the two countries? Uh, what, what kind of incentives can trigger interest uh, from companies to invest in Greece, to expedite trade relations, or even set up distribution hubs in Greece? And how can we support any such interests from uh, our end? Thank you. Well, Hong Kong used to be uh, the world's number one in terms of our container business. Now it's number eight. But never mind, uh, we will go for high-end maritime services. And that's where we could connect the mainland ports or the mainland shipping business with the ports and the business in Greece. Uh, my secretary for transport and uh, housing, who is also in charge of maritime, actually um, took roadshow to Greece. Rotterdam and all these imports and ports in previous years. Now, in terms of maritime services, what my government is doing is um, we are providing tax incentives uh, for various maritime services uh, and for their principles in time to come for the maritime principles to set up in Hong Kong. 
We are also providing uh, service desks in some of the uh, overseas, our overseas offices like Shanghai, Singapore, and maybe Rotterdam, uh, in order to facilitate uh, the shipping business because we are very important shipping register uh, in the world. Uh, we are also happy to provide uh, uh, Greek uh, shipping business with um, financing, uh, leasing, uh, insurance, and all these um, high-end services, which at the moment maybe London is providing those, but on in this part of the world, uh, especially working with um, the mainland ports, I think Hong Kong could play that role uh, equally well. So uh, this is where we could continue to work. Of course, on other things like uh, export, we, we, we love to, to, um, to have more trade, export and so on, because we are still a very important um, re-export hub. So goods from uh, mainland of China to Greece could come through Hong Kong, uh, either through our transshipment business or other things. Uh, but certainly maritime, uh, is one of the uh, industries that in recent years, especially in my term of government, knowing very well that we could no longer be highly competitive in the container port business, we should go for the maritime service business. And that perhaps will make us more competitive because um, the Greeks will continue to have a very robust um, uh, port business, especially with some mainland investment. But we will not compete on that business. We will compete on the maritime services business. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for um, giving us uh, the chance uh, for um, to attend to this important event. I am Ricardo Fuochi, I'm the chairman of the Italian Hong Kong Business Association and uh, there is a long history of uh, friendship and uh, commercial cooperation between Italy and Hong Kong and uh, the Italian company still trust Hong Kong as the place to be. In light uh, of the numerous initiatives and uh, commercial opportunities provided for in the policy address 2020, is there a particular advantage for the Italian companies and therefore for our associate willing to tap the Asian market through Hong Kong, also taking in consideration that uh, Italy has signed a formal agreement with the government, Chinese government for the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, I, I, I'd like to invite uh, Edward to say a few things mm -hmm. because he, he is uh, overseeing the, the Belt and Road and we have a dedicated office on the Belt and Road. So uh, our Belt and Road office, as I've just mentioned at the beginning, we play this um, connectivity role. So on yeah. Belt and Road, we are standing ready to connect the mainland companies uh, to uh, other Belt and Road partners. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, had it not been um, COVID-19, um, I myself and a, a, and a delegate no less than 50 um, businessmen, professional people would have visited Italy last year because exactly for the reason you mentioned that, well, Italy and, and um, China has signed on agreement in the sort of mutual promotion of the Belt and Road and other opportunities. Uh, in fact, uh, Hong Kong uh, served a very crucial role in the country's Belt and Road Initiative, which to us is in fact China's uh, companies going out and at the same time bring interest into the mainland. So as um, the, the chief executive mentioned, now, said, I think we serve this very important role as a gateway and nothing better than seeing um, a lot of the sort of a mainland interest, investment, infrastructure development, trade and services finding new market and also collaboration. And in fact, Europe as a whole has been a very strong partner with mainland in terms of uh, the complementary sort of uh, trading relations. And I think uh, in particular for Italy with from innovation to fashion, from arts and culture to consumer products, I think there are a lot of things that we can, we can work together. Now the, the role that Hong Kong serve is typically to uh, offer something which can help to sort of uh, strengthen this tie. And I would particularly mention two areas. One is professional services. Now, when we see mainland company, which are uh, sort of growing in size, go out and also engage in cross country or even transcontinental project like railway, port development, city development, what they need would be money, financing. And actually no single sort of enterprises would have sufficient capital for the mega size project. But the financing part of it could be done through the financial market in Hong Kong. 
And arising from that, there would be a lot of professional services in need from bankers, financier, uh, accounting, uh, business consulting to a sort of a uh, constructional sort of a, a industries and also from insurance to arbitrations. Now, that's typically what Hong Kong can offer. And that's why whenever we go out to sort of promote a Belt and Road a collaboration, in my delegation, usually include, in addition to traditional businessmen, there's all these professional services uh, uh, partners. The second area would be, uh, I would say, IT, but more focused on smart city development which I think Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area are good at. I think typically they would be sort of a finding a market for such technology to be applied. And at the same time, bring in sort of technology in the reverse sort of channel back to the mainland. So I think in these two areas, in sort of services, professional support for mega deals, for uh, cross-country sort of a investment, Hong Kong serves a role, and also in the IT sector as well. And Hong Kong will continue to pay that role. I'd like to, uh, to raise a question, um, also uh, a number of elements um, are already uh, mentioned. Uh, when we see the history of Hong Kong, um, uh, we all know that, that the trade with all, um, um, all the possibilities for doing business with and via Hong Kong is clear. Um, we all know that the future position of Hong Kong will be different compared with the past. And um, from an economic perspective, um, especially uh, with the added value of using Hong Kong as a hub for doing business in Asia, um, I'm curious um, uh, for, uh, for the elements and the, the, the special areas where Hong Kong will have focus. Uh, financial position is already mentioned, but I'm also curious about the, the position of Hong Kong in the GBA and also the competition uh, with mainland China. Um, is it possible to, to explain a bit more in detail uh, for, for all of us, for the associations, but also companies involved, what can be expected? Um, uh, yes, you are right that uh, in uh, looking into the future, Hong Kong's role will be somewhat different, but the fundamentals uh, will be the same. Uh, that uh, we are part of the People's Republic of China, but we are not just another Chinese city. Uh, we are an international city and the country wants us to be as international as possible. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is uh, we are now uh, um, trying and aiming to integrate better into the national development. So that's why at the beginning I mentioned about this 14th uh, five-year plan. And within a 14th five-year plan, uh, which will be promulgated in March this year, uh, I can foresee a stronger emphasis on Hong Kong's role, not only in the usual international aviation, uh, maritime, but in technology. So they would uh, put, um, 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 the central government will put uh, more emphasis on Hong Kong in terms of uh, contributing to growing an international technology hub in the Greater Bay Area uh, because of the um, advantages or the strengths that I just uh, mentioned earlier on. So um, I, I think it is in innovation and technology that uh, there is plenty of uh, scope for European companies to base in Hong Kong, work with us, but then knowing very well that there is a much, much bigger market in the Greater Bay Area uh, and, and also beyond the Greater Bay Area, because in the um, national blueprint, the Greater Bay Area uh, is able to radiate into other parts of the mainland China. It's just like um, Shenzhen has recently been given a mandate that after 40 years of being a special economic zone, uh, they are now going to grow into what they call a demonstration hub that they would demonstrate for the rest of the uh, nation uh, how to move technology uh, forward. And that's how I see Hong Kong better integrating into the national development. So we are, we are a financial center, we continue to be a trading hub, but this is one single area that uh, we will have a new positioning. And to prepare for that, uh, my government in the last three and a half years, we have already invested 100 billion Hong Kong dollars. That is more than 10 billion euros uh, in innovation and technology. Uh, actually a couple of hours ago in our legislature, they have uh, just approved another $18 billion for a second science park in Hong Kong, which is very close to Shenzhen. It's actually right at the border 
between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. So uh, this is going to be a Hong Kong Shenzhen Technology Park. Uh, the first building, the first batch of buildings will be ready in 2024. But in the next three to four years, Shenzhen readily welcomes our tech companies under our management to go into a Shenzhen Technology Park to occupy some of the premises there to start the business. And of course, when I said our technology companies, I do mean also overseas companies that uh, set up in our science park and our cyber park. And of course, big companies will have the, um, the, uh, the, the leverage of a big company, but Hong Kong is also very good for startups. In a mere uh, five years or so, we have uh, tripled the number of startups in Hong Kong. Now we have 3,300 startups. And what is interesting is uh, there is a large percentage, about over one quarter of the startups are non-local. So you will imagine a startup is a very small company. How could a non-local company uh, come to Hong Kong to start up? That's because of our environment, which makes it very easy to set up a company. We provide incubation at our science park or cyber port, and we provide venture capital if they have good ideas that could be commercialized. And within the uh, uh, non-locals, of course, um, UK has a larger uh, share of about 12%, but uh, France is not bad. 8% of the non-local startups are, are coming from France, another 4% from Germany, 4% from Italy. And I don't have a figures from Netherlands. Uh, I look forward to more <laughs> Netherlands uh, startups, young people coming to, um, to work with us. And don't underestimate this place called Hong Kong. In a mere five years, we have groomed eight unicorns. That is uh, with a value of over 1 billion US dollars, right? Over 1 billion US dollars. So uh, this is an area I, I really think uh, that it will be our focus. And I hope it will also be the uh, focus of our, of our EU companies. Um, thank you very much, um, Chief Executive. Um, uh, we're now... Uh, moving on to the questions um, from the audience, uh, where we've had uh, a lot of questions being raised in the chat. Um, so as uh, I mentioned, uh, it won't be possible to address all of those questions, um, but I would hope that officials can also come back um, to some of the specific questions which are being raised, in particular uh, questions around investment um, and particular opportunities uh, which have been um, mentioned by some of the questions in the chat. Um, but I'll um, start with a first question um, where someone has raised concerns uh, around the positioning of Hong Kong, uh, saying the success of Hong Kong has always been tied to its freedom, its transparent and efficient legal system, um, and now the situation has changed dramatically in the last few years. Does this mean Hong Kong will become less relevant to the world's economy, losing its unique, historical, diverse and cosmopolitan appeal? Well, uh, I have to challenge that, uh, that statement. Um, it has not changed dramatically. Those uh, strengths and fundamentals of Hong Kong are still there. Uh, the freedoms, the rights enjoyed by individuals, the independence of a judiciary, the transparency of a legal system, the accessibility to legal aid, all these are there. What has gone wrong is um, in um, the second half of 2019, arising from a government proposal, uh, we have seen a huge uproar um, expressed in terms of very strong anti-government and anti-China uh, sentiments, uh, which some people would describe as very close to a colored revolution. <coughs> And subsequently, we did see some organized activities um, on uh, verging on subversion that tried to overthrow uh, the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So we are tackling these issues uh, legally and professionally. Legally is we have enacted, or the country, the central government has enacted a piece of national legislation to safeguard national security. But in respect and recognition of one country, two systems, in this piece of legislation, the primary responsibility for implementation, that is investigation, prosecution, and trial, is given to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. I would challenge any country that would delegate such an important function to a state or a province. 
uh, to discharge. But in our case, uh, I am the chairman. I'm the chairman of a national security committee in Hong Kong to implement a piece of uh, national legislation made by the highest um, um, organ of power, that is the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China. And so whatever we, we are doing is legal, is proper. Uh, it's transparent. Uh, we are as transparent as, uh, as previously. We, we come out to explain to people what this is all about. And also I will challenge people who complain that their rights and freedoms have been compromised. Give me concrete evidence of what sort of freedoms have been compromised. You just have to read the daily newspapers in Hong Kong, whether it's in the Chinese or SEMP. There were, there were f- freedom of expression every day, attacking the government, uh, criticizing the mainland of China, or even criticizing president and so on. So, so I, I have to challenge uh, those remarks. Uh, if people said, that, oh, you don't have all those protests and um, uh, public order events or marches on the streets every Sunday, that's because of COVID-19. <laughs> the COVID-19 has a restriction uh, of a gathering. And we are very stringent, I have to say. We are prohibiting public gatherings uh, of more than two persons. So with that in place, uh, you are not seeing that. But once that is uh, over, if uh, people want to uh, um, apply to have a public order event, they could do it. Well, we would just issue, the police would just issue a no objection and they can go on the streets again to express their political views or discontent about the government. So I, I don't see any any uh, um, substantiation of that sort of attack, especially the legal system. Uh, The legal system is the linchpin of Hong Kong's success. And that means that people have to abide by the law. Uh, The prosecution of um, uh, individuals or uh, entities uh, is done independently by the Department of Justice prosecutors. I don't get myself involved in prosecution. That will be bridging the basic law. And finally, uh, trials are taking place in our, our, our courts and our courts are very uh, world famous for upholding independence because final in terms of final adjudication it also takes place in Hong Kong at the Court of Final Appeal and in the Court of Final Appeal we have uh, very distinguished overseas judges presiding so if Hong Kong is not independent if Hong Kong is uh, bridging uh, the um, the fundamentals of uh, of a proper legal system. I doubt very much that we will have those uh, distinguished judges willing to serve on the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. Uh, but uh, if you read the uh, media uh, reports or watch uh, some of the um, electronic media, you may give, get a different impression. <laughs> I'm to say that there's a lot of prejudice against Hong Kong when it comes to reports of rights and freedoms and uh, uh, democracy uh, issues. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm also uh, doing on the offensive. I, I, I will continue to do more interviews. I've done two with CNBC and Bloomberg. So if you are happy, you can watch those uh, uh, interviews um, uh, on on video and understand more about the uh, challenges that Hong Kong is now facing and try to give us a fair hearing. Uh, a number of questions in the chat um, have talked about exchange of people, tourism, culture, um, but also the restrictions uh, of COVID-19 and how this is impacting uh, on these exchanges. Uh, what do you foresee uh, in terms of uh, the coming month? Um, when can restrictions be loosened? Uh, what is the approach uh, of the Hong Kong um, government uh, in terms of COVID-19? Well, uh, we, are, we are into the first anniversary of tackling um, the COVID-19. Um, if one looks at it objectively, Hong Kong situation is not bad at all. Uh, total number of confirmed cases uh, just exceeds 10,000 uh, for 7.5 million population. So in terms of a number of um, cases per uh, 1 million, I think we are only one-tenth of the world average. In terms of deaths, we have only now, not only, I shouldn't say that, we have about 180. Uh, that was also um, uh, a reasonable figure in terms of measuring the success of um, isolating and um, uh, treating uh, patients. 
Um, but uh, we are in an area which uh, others have done so well, <laughs> especially compared to the mainland of China to Macau. Uh, Macau has uh, no case for a very long time already, and the mainland of China has really very impressively uh, contain the spread of virus. I think everybody has to salute uh, China for the huge effort they have put into in containing the spread of uh, COVID-19. But as a result of that, uh, Hong Kong really has to double our efforts to prevent the, um, the importation of um, infections uh, from other parts of the world because the global situation is still very worrying. And at the same time, we need to contain the spread of the virus uh, within Hong Kong's territory. So in a former strategy, yes, we have been very stringent in terms of requiring uh, everyone to come in and 21 day quarantine. And for some high risk places like UK uh, and South Africa, it's, different, it's almost impossible to board a plane to come to Hong Kong these days. Uh, we look forward to, um, we now have, um, I hope, seeing the end or towards the end of the fourth wave of the COVID-19 and with only um, maybe 20, 30 cases every day. And so uh, um, we're working very hard in the lead up of the Chinese New Year, appealing to people to avoid social gatherings and family gatherings over the Chinese New Year holiday. And hopefully after that, uh, we will be able to relax some of the uh, measures. Uh, actually, in around November, before this uh, new wave uh, hit us, we have entered into air bubble, uh, travel, air travel bubble with Singapore and with other places. So once we are in a situation ready, then we will revive those arrangements to enable uh, some travel to resume because um, Hong Kong is a very international city. Without that, uh, people coming in and going out. Uh, it is causing a lot of difficulties uh, to businesses as well as to our tourism. So uh, I cannot promise a date, but uh, things look uh, not bad because uh, of the effectiveness of our contained strategy, and especially with vaccine. Uh, we have bought enough vaccine. We are waiting for the vaccine to come to Hong Kong. Then we will roll out an extensive vaccination program and uh, if we manage to have um, a large percentage of Hong Kong people vaccinated, that of course also contributes to uh, the um, possibility of uh, opening up our borders and uh, resuming travel and so on. Um, I, I hope to, um, to be able to do that as soon as possible, but uh, the first thing is to ensure safety uh, to, to the people of Hong Kong. So I hope you understand that. Thank you. Uh, another theme to pick up um, from the questions is uh, around sustainability and the commitment uh, of Hong Kong to sustainability, um, what uh, impact this will have on the business environment and how Hong Kong can ensure that uh, it walks the walk and not just talks the talk on sustainability. I will invite the Secretary for Environment to say a few things. Sir. Okay, thank you for asking questions about the environment. As mentioned by the chief executive, uh, and announced in her policy address a uh, few months ago, that Hong Kong pledged to reach carbon neutrality before 2050. In fact, we have already reached our peak uh, emissions by 2014. So Hong Kong has been one of the pioneering cities in Asia on decarbonisation. And within Hong Kong, there are four key aspects in relation to carbon emissions. Electricity generation, uh, energy saving and green building. Fourth is about the transportation sector. And fourth is about waste management. As indicated by uh, the chief executive that we are going to launch Hong Kong's first uh, electric vehicle uh, roadmap very soon within a few months. And we set a target to phase out the new sales of uh, private uh, uh, cars if they are not EV. In fact, Hong Kong's EV ratio among the private cars is one of the highest in Asia, outside oh. mainland China. Last year, despite the pandemic, every eight new private vehicles, one was EV. And we are subsidizing the EV oh. charging facilities upgrade amongst uh, the housing estates in Hong Kong. And that would be another significant uh, push to make the EV more popular in Hong Kong. In fact, I met uh, some of the 
automobile uh, leaders in Hong Kong, they are from Europe, talking about how to support Hong Kong's EV popularization, not only on private vehicles, but also on commercial vehicles, buses, lorries, etc. So there were worse opportunities uh, for us to use the best technologies from around the world, including Europe, to support Hong Kong to meet our pledge on decarbonization, on improving air quality, and also reduce waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a number of questions have also been raised in terms of the financial sector, um, which has been identified as uh, the, the core um, driver of competitiveness uh, for Hong Kong. Um, but there were also uh, concerns raised about whether the financial sector could retain its cutting edge, uh, how competition would look like um, also with other financial centers, including uh, Shanghai. Um, so um, that was uh, another block of questions. I'll invite the Secretary of Financial Services and Treasury, uh, Chris, to say something on that. Uh, thanks for the question. And regarding Hong Kong's financial services, I think one thing is crystal clear is the fact that we are the most international financial center of China and also in this part of the world. If you look at the turnover, average daily turnover, basically if, uh, we see a 50%, 50% increase uh, last year as compared to the three year before last. And also if you look at our connectivity to the rest of the world, in particular our European investors, almost 30% of our investors in our cash capital market is from Europe. And at the same time, if you look at our collaboration with various jurisdictions in Europe, including Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, so on and so forth, we have a whole series of uh, mutual recognition of funds arrangements with these jurisdictions, so as to allow the funds registered in each of our markets to be sold to the retail investors in the other market through a very much a seam, seam, a streamlined regulatory process. So all these connectivity with the rest of the world and also the fact that we are going to draw liquidity from different parts of the world is something that distinguishes us from other financial centers. And to make that possible, there are a number of underlying strengths that is in unique possession of ours. First of all, is the fact that we have a rule of law as highlighted by Chief Executive earlier. And also is the fact that we are still very much the system that is widely acceptable by the international community. Just to quote you an example, uh, as highlighted by the chief executive at the outset of this seminar, um, we just issued 2.5 billion US dollars of green bonds. And among them, there are three tranches. And we also managed to be the only government in Asia to be able to issue green bonds lasting for 30 year tenure. So it's something that is a clear testimony of the confidence of the international community in our market and also in the government. So I'll uh, raise one last question um, and then I'll hand over to Kerry Lam to um, conclude um, this, this uh, session. Um, so the question comes back to the political situation, um, which has been raised by a number of people um, as a concern. Um, and uh, the comment was that it's less it's, uh, about security on the street than what people perceive uh, to be the security of individuals, including um, the heads of companies, CEOs. Uh, so what is the consequences uh, about uh, if they criticize China uh, or the Hong Kong government? Um, and there's a specific question here also about strong concerns with actions taken against elected representatives of the European Union. Um, but with those, um, I'll close. I um, just want to say thank you from my perspective um, for uh, letting me moderate this session and for answering the questions, but I leave the last word uh, to uh, the Chief Executive. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much. About that last question on the political front, let me just um, reiterate um, nothing has changed in terms of uh, upholding and respecting individual rights and freedoms uh, in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. That was um, um, enshrined in the basic law. So the Hong Kong SL government will faithfully uh, stick to what is in the basic law. So uh, that very um, um, sort of uh, comment about <laughs> CEOs of um, overseas companies uh, criticizing our government. You are always welcome to criticize 
the government. Uh, there's a freedom of speech in Hong Kong. And what has changed is only the national security law, which is very specific about four types of offenses. And I'm sure every jurisdiction, every country in Europe will have national security law to guard against those offenses and endangering national security. That is subversion, cessation, terrorist activities and collusion to endanger national security. That's it, okay? Everything is done legally. Uh, in Hong Kong situation. Uh, uh, so there's no worry about um, the freedoms being undermined. As far as, uh, I don't know whether that question, uh, uh, elected representatives is about the so-called pro-democracy activists. We do not arrest people on the basis of their political ideology of affiliation. But by the same token, somebody with a certain political philosophy does not make him or her immune to committing offenses, right? Everyone is equal uh, in front of a law. Every, every, the law is applied um, equally to every individual. That's why the lady justice is blindfolded. We don't see the individuals of the background uh, in doing this arrest and prosecution is based on the law, based on evidence and then tried uh, by an independent court. So um, I want to, uh, make that absolutely clear, because uh, as I said, uh, if you read some of the reports, uh, that's a very uh, entirely different story. Um, we, are, I, I, we are complaining uh, to an international financial newspapers that tended to write things uh, in a very biased manner. They talk about arbitration, that Hong Kong has no more status for arbitration, which was wrong. <laughs> the Secretary of Justice has to issue a lengthy letter to refute that. And this morning they talk about, we are warning students about national security. We are not warning. <laughs> we are educating and uh, protecting our students from this, uh, uh, this undue interferences. So I want to uh, conclude by uh, thanking our um, uh, European business community uh, co-organizing this uh, very interesting uh, dialogue with myself and my three colleagues. And uh, we really look forward to uh, working uh, with you all in the days and months ahead. Let me just add, end by doing a further promotion because when I was uh, Chief Secretary for Administration, chairing the committee I just mentioned, this IBC, International Business Committee, the overseas chambers will always put to me that there are three worries uh, on their mind when they came to Hong Kong. One is, air quality. Second is uh, the high rental of our offices and also our residential units. Third is the availability of international school places. Because when they come, very often they want to bring their family. So they have these three issues. If you ask me in, um, in five years time, uh, or in, in the past few years, we have more or less address these problems. Uh, so at least if you look at 2021, or maybe even 2022, all those three factors will be more favorable uh, for Hong Kong. One is the air quality has significantly improved. Uh, you can go to our website to look at some of the figures that uh, my secretary has published about the improvement or the reduction in the pollutants um, uh, on the roadside and in air. Every day is a blue sky in Hong Kong now. Rental has come down especially office rental, double digit. It has come down double digit. Residential has also come down, not as much as rental. And there is plenty of uh, office spaces, not only in the central business district, which is our CBD, but now in a second CBD on the Eastern side of Kowloon, where we see all these uh, big insurance companies, Manulife and Citibank all move into this second uh, central business district. On international schools, Hong Kong is the place with the largest number of international schools and places. We have over 50 international schools offering international and uh, various curriculum, the German Swiss, the French International, the Harrow, and so on, uh, providing over 46,000 student places. It used to be very sought after, but now because of various things happening and because of the new international schools being developed with the land that the government provides free of charge. In a place like Hong Kong, we are providing land free of charge and we are providing an interest-free loan for the building of new international schools. Like the uh, French International School has its new campus uh, open two years ago, uh, which is its fourth campus uh, in Hong Kong and Shrewsbury 
at Malvern or have a new international school. I would say that now, if you if you bring a young family to Hong Kong, it's it's not very difficult to get into an international school of your choice. So with those more favorable um, uh, factors, I hope that uh, we'll be seeing more of you uh, in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. <laughs>